you who are joining us and it's still early morning in your end Carl probably should say good morning and also thank you for taking the opportunity and taking the time to wake up early or to um, give us like one hour to learn more about IPv6. Okay, so in this particular module, we will be discussing about IPv6 addressing and subnetting. In this class, there is some assumption that you have at least heard of about IPv6. Now, this course actually comes as part of a series. The first of the series is called IPv6 uh, Overview. Okay, so an introduction to IPv6 basically. So if you find that some of the words here, some of the um, topics that I'm discussing here is a bit hard to follow, so um, it's probably because you haven't um, joined that previous class. So that one will give you more of an overview of also the reasons why we have this new thing called IPv6, all right? So in this part, our main goal is really to get you started with, um, mainly to give you a background of the IP, IPv6 addresses that we are using. There is a difference in IPv4 and IPv6 addresses. I'm sure you already know that, but what are these differences? How are we, how do we type in the IPv6 addresses? What are the different types of addresses that are used for IPv6? That's what we're going to tackle today. So before I do that, of course, let me just first introduce myself. My name is Cheryl Hermoso. I am a training officer with APNIC. So as part of APNIC, we go out and do either face-to-face -face trainings where we basically go to different economies, different APNIC members and members of the internet community to um, spread uh, like the message or to deliver training sessions and workshops, either three-day or five-day workshops, to our um, community. So the topics that we conduct are mainly the things here that I put down, which is also my specialties. So we do internet resource management. We also do, of course, IPv6 and DNS, DNSSEC, and also network security. So those are the main topics, of course. There are subtopics that fall under these categories. So um, if you can't attend any of those face-to-face -face trainings, we have e-learning. So this is an e-learning course. We conduct e-learning classes for one hour. So every Wednesday, we conduct three of those one-hour sessions. So if you find that this particular class is something that you want to do again in the future, or if like, there's other topics that uh, you want to attend to, then uh, please go to our website at apnic.net slash training and find a specific topic that you want to discuss. Okay, uh, so you can, you, get to, you can attend that. E-learning courses are, of course, offered for free to everyone. Okay, so this class particularly will run for one hour. Okay, so we will provide as much as possible, just about 15 minutes for the lesson proper. And then towards the end, if we have enough time, let's do a bit more discussion. If you have questions, something that you haven't asked of uh, the class, then that is the time to do it. But as much as possible, since I, I usually tell this to my class, I want this to be as interactive as possible. I don't like, um, I want to get feedback from you as often as possible. So if you have anything to say, whether it be comments, whether it be questions, then at any time while I'm speaking, please feel free to write down those questions or suggestions in the chat panel. That's how you are going to communicate with me because audio and video is not allowed for the participants, mainly because of bandwidth issues. So the way to communicate with me again is only using the chat. No microphone, uh, no audio, okay? So also, uh, just a reminder that towards the end, there is um, a short survey, like a feedback form, where I'm encouraging everyone to like, please fill it up so we can like get your feedback whether you've enjoyed the class and also if like there are other topics that you wish to be discussed possibly in the future that we are not doing yet. So yes, that is it for our introduction. It took a bit long, but now we're ready to go on and discuss about IPv6 addressing. Okay, so first and foremost, how many of you here have already attended the uh, e-learning course about IPv6 overview. OK, 
landscape or IPV6 introduction. Has any of you attended that class before? So uh, I'm getting some people who, okay, they're saying no, some of them had. Okay, for the benefit of those who have not attended that class, I will give you a very brief summary of what exactly is IPv6. So just an introduction before we proceed with editing. Uh, it will probably just take two, three minutes of our time. So what is IPv6? IPv6, as you might have heard of, is the new version of the Internet Layer Protocol. It is part of, of course, the TCP IP suite of protocols. And the main goal of IPv6 is as a replacement okay, of IPv4, possibly in the future. Um, for now, the, our goal is mainly to have both IPv4 and IPv6 um, operating at the same time. Now, why do we have this? What is the main compelling reason for having IPv6? That is mainly because we are already running out of IPv4 addresses. At the start of the internet, around 1970s, early 1980s, we, um, well, the internet uh, personalities, or the, the, um, the, the people who kind of invented the, the internet at that time, came up, of course, with the IPv4 protocol, and of course, the IPv4 addressing. Now, um, at that time, there were too many, uh, like too small a number of hosts or computers that will actually use up those IP addresses. So they never thought that the IPv4 pool, which is, if you are not familiar yet, it is around 4.3 billion addresses, okay, theoretically. Um, they never thought that we will have to, like, we will run out of those addresses at a certain point. Now, at this year, uh, it's 2012, okay, mainly around 30 years from the invention of the internet, 35 years if you consider the early stages of ARPANET, we are at that point. We are at the brink of running out of IPv4 addresses. It doesn't mean that we don't have them anymore, but it means that we have a very limited supply, okay? So um, that is why we have IPv6, okay? Because if there are newer machines that wanted to connect to the internet and we don't have IPv4 addresses anymore, how are we going to um, allow them? How are we going to make them have them the opportunity to connect to the internet, okay? So um, the internet will still be here whether or not we, have, we don't have IPv6, whether or not we just stay with IPv4, but to allow for future growth, possibly IPv6 is necessary, okay? So with actually, if you think about it, we just our current um, population, we're reaching about 7 million already, right? So just with that, you can see that 4.3 billion compared to 7 billion population, not everyone, of course, needed IP addresses at this point, but some time in the future, they will. Even just one person nowadays, will have at least two, three gadgets all to himself, okay? So that will be even more in the future, okay? So just something um, um, like to, to, to think about, like if we want to proceed, okay, if we want the internet to grow, then possibly we need a newer addressing scheme. That is why we have IPv6. Now, IPv6 addresses is very huge. The address space is so huge. If IPv4 is 4.3 billion addresses altogether, IPv6 is 2 raised to 128. Okay? That is because an IPv6 address cons consists of 128 bits. Okay? IPv4 is 32 bits only. It's 32 bit blocks. Okay? So when you write that down, actually, it's so easy, right? So how do we write an IPv4 address? We're using what we call a dotted decimal notation or dotted decimal digit. What we do from that 32 bits is we divide them into octets. So 8 bits, okay, the first 8 bits is divided from the second 8 bits by a dot. Okay, in that 8 bits from binary, it is represented as a decimal number. Okay, so an example of an IPv4 address is, of course, 10 dot say just an easy one 10 dot 10 dot 100 dot 101 okay i'm not sure if you can see my handwrite uh yeah i've written something on on the page so that's 
an example of a very easy IPv4 address. So it's decimal digits, okay, four fields of that, and then they are divided by a dot. Now think about IPv6. IPv6 is written the representation of an IPv6 address is different from the representation of IPv4. We're no longer using dots. Instead, we are going to use colons. We are not using decimals. Instead, we are now using a hexadecimal digits. Okay, that's two. The third one is we're not using, we're not dividing them into eight bits each. Instead, we are going to, uh, like we are going to group them as 32 bits each. Okay, so I hope you, you got it, got, uh, um, you understand that part. Um, I have a question asking why 102 is to 128. So I think you're referring particularly to this. Okay, the reason for that is mainly because an IPv6 address has 128 bits long. And we're talking about binary here. Okay, so it's like um, um, a powers of two. So if you're talking about how many possible digits you can put in 128 bits, that's two raised to 128. So we're talking about exponents. Okay, so I hope that answers your question. So if you think about it, how big is two raised to 128? This is the actual number. That is huge. I don't even know how to say it. Okay, it's not millions, it's not even billions, it's even more than that. So that is the number of IPv6 addresses that is possible to be used as an address on different hosts, on different machines that want to connect to the internet. So um, if, if you want to write an IPv6 address, you should be familiar with hexadecimal digits. Okay, as I've said, we're not using decimals, we are using hexadecimal digits. So what's the difference between the two? When you see decimal, that's from 0 to 10. Okay, with hexadecimal, the numbering scheme is different, of course, because like it's um, 16 different digits. So, so 0 going all the way to F. Okay, can you guys follow? So, um... Each hexadecimal digit is actually equivalent to four bits, okay? So let's say you have a zero hex. A zero in hex is equivalent to, let me type that, zero, 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 zero in binary, okay? So one hex digit is four um, binary bits. So if you can see this, I typed something here. Okay. So sometimes I think that there is there is a confusion when you're doing addressing when you see a zero, you try to um, think about it's an actual like a zero and bi binary. When actually when you see an IPv6 address, the zero there is hexadecimal, therefore it's equivalent to four zeros. Okay, when we say four bits, we can also say that it's a nibble. That's how we call that. It's a nibble. A nibble is four bits. And since we're using hex, now we can trim down the IPv6 address into just 32 hex digits. Okay, do you understand? So 32 hex digits because from 128, we trim that down. We're using hex now. Each hex is equivalent to four bits. Therefore, only 32 hex digits. This is an example of an IPv6 address. 2001 colon DC0 colon A910 colon colon. When you read an IPv6 address like this, you don't usually usually say 2001. Okay? And it's a bit just a nit nitpicking, but when you say 2001, usually you will think about decimal. So you call it 2001. Okay, so all of this is divided or separated by a colon. Okay, I have one question asking for what comes after a colon colon in hex. I'll answer that question 
once we've finished with the next slide, okay? If you don't understand the next slide, then I'll answer this question for you. But um, altogether, when, when I discuss that slide, your question should be answered. So you can see here, I am only using three fields. Each of the fields is, of course, how many binary digits? What do you think? This is four bits, of course. The two here, two hex is equivalent to, if you want to write that down in binary, two is equivalent, oh, it's actually here. So, um, no, let's just use this one first because that's what we have on this slide. So zero here, when you write that down in hex, is zero, 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 zero. One here, one in hex is zero, 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 one. 9 in hex is equivalent to 1000. And as you can see, since we're using hexadecimal, we're also using characters from A to F. So that's 11 to um, um, 10 to 16. Okay, so A here is equivalent to 1010. So as you can see, each field is composed of how many bits? 16. 16 bits is equivalent to just this one field. So if you actually type down this field, the first field, 2001 in binary, that will be 1010, um, uh, then all zeros, eight of them, and then 0001. Okay, so that's how you interpret it. Okay, so I hope you can still follow. Um, that will, uh, if you have any questions right now, um, that will be answered in this slide. So the way we write down an IPvC address, again, is using hexadecimal. So each hexadecimal digit is four bits. It's called nibble. So each field will now have, okay, 16 bits per field. So that leaves us with how many fields? Eight fields. So eight fields, each field has 16 bits, and each field is separated by a color. Okay, clear? I don't want to go ahead if this is not clear. So I'll give you an example. This is an example of an, of an IPv6 address. It's a valid IPv6 address. So as you can see here, it's like um, all used up. All our 32 bits, 32 uh, hexadecimal digits are being used up. So how many fields have we got? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay. Each field has how many hexadecimal digits? Four. One, two, three, four. Right? And each of the fields are divided, separated by what? A colon. Okay? Now, even if you, it's like this, sometime, somehow 32 hex digits is still really long. Nowadays, we have just have started using IPv6. So we are using the first few, um, like, um, the first few parts of our IPv6 address, and as you will notice once you have your v6 addresses, you are actually dealing with a lot of zeros. Okay, so there are ways in which you can write down an IPv6 address such that it is uh, trimmed down. You can remove a lot of those zeros. So these are some of the ways. First, of course, if you have a leading zero. What do you mean a leading zero? A zero in the most significant bits of your field. Where is an example of that? So see, um, if you see this one, the second field, 0023. So zero, 00 there is actually a leading, okay? These are leading zeros. What are we saying? What's the rule? Well, we can just remove leading zeros. So 0023 can be removed this and just represent it as 2, 3. Okay, next, this also, this field here, and as well as the next two fields, they all have zeros. Now, using the same rule, we can just remove this 3, we can also remove this, and this, that's why we have just one, uh, one um, hex digit per field, okay? How about this next one, 036E? So what we can do there is again the same rule, just remove zero. 
So what about these last two fields? What do you think? Can we remove this zero? And this zero, can we do that? Well, as you can see in the next line, of course you can't. It's in the least significant bits, therefore you retain it. Okay, so that still remains as 1, 2, 5, 0 and 2, B, 0, 0. That will be your last two fields of this IPv6 address. Okay, so that is uh, one of the rules. The next rule is if you have groups of zeros, or, meaning, or what mean by that is if you have um, a, a different fields okay, adjacent to each other that all have zeros. Okay, so where is that? We are actually referring, of course, to these three fields here, which are all zeros. Or since we both already trimmed it down, this one also all have zeros. So what we do with that is just remove all those fields altogether and then use double columns. So remember someone was asking me earlier about double columns. The, the representation for double, uh, the double columns represent okay, a group of zeros. How do we know how many fields are there? Simple. We know that there should be eight fields in an IPv6 address. So whatever fields you have here, one, two, three, four, five, okay? So that means this double columns is the remaining out of those eight fields, which means it represents three fields, okay? You can only do that for consecutive or adjacent fields of zeros. Now, what if, I have a question for you, what if um, we have two sets with zeros? So I'll write down something, let's say 2001 db8, 0, 0, 0, 1, Remove that. ABC zero zero one two three four five six seven eight. Okay. So let's take this as an example. Can you see this? The one on top. This is also an example of an IPv6 address. Okay. So um we have, as you can see, we have two sets of, like two groups of zeros. One is here, okay, we have three, and another one here. Now my question is, which one should you, um, like, represent as a double column? Or can I represent both of these as a double column? So um, can you write your answers on the chat if you have any answers, please? Okay. Okay, one question, one answer from GM Wahid. It's 2001 DB8 colon colon ABC. Um, okay. Other people are writing, so I'm having a hard time reading all your comments. Okay, I have one correct. Okay, Ling, um, I'll explain your answer later on. And R A R Sohan, R Sohan, got the same answer as Wahid. Okay, so um, okay, let me let me write down the all the possible answers. One answer is of course this is two zero zero one DB eight colon colon A B C colon zero colon zero. Okay, that's one possible answer. I see like two of you answered that. Another possible answer is 2001 DB8. Then you put in all the three zeros, A, B, C, colon, colon. Okay, did any of you answer this? So this is the second possible answer. The third possible answer that I got from you is 2001 DB8, colon, colon, A, B, C, colon, colon. Okay, so let's discuss the third possible answer first. So let's discuss this. Let's discuss this third one. Is this possible? Um, ideally, yes, but there is a problem with this. Now, how many fields have we got? Should, there should be eight fields. Now, 
How many fields does this double column represent? Do you know? And how many fields does this double column represent? Do you know? Altogether, these two double columns represent five fields. But can we be sure whether this one has three and this one has two? Are we sure about that? Because it's also possible that this field actually only has two, po two possible fields and this double column has got three. Is that right? So this is vague. So this is not correct. Please don't use this one. Okay? I saw someone um, put that as an answer. So don't, don't do this. This is not um, a, a possible answer. This is not a correct answer. Okay? So um, the, we are left with two other ones, which is this and this. Okay? Um, 2001 DB8 double column ABC 0, 0. So what she did there is um, change the one with more fields of zeros, okay? You chose to represent that as a double column, and of course, the other two has remained. In most cases, this is, this is a positive, this is the correct answer. This is correct. Okay? However, this one is also correct. Do you know why? Um, because there, there is really, um, no one is really telling you which, which one to use because apparently if you put type that in and you're in your operating systems or maybe in your um, um, networking devices, it will, it still knows how to like interpret that, okay? It will still expand that IPv6 address. This is mainly for us, for, um, for humans because it's easier to write them down that way. Now, both of these are correct. However, if you look at the RFC, and I think it's RFC, if I'm not mistaken, it's RFC 4291 that um, discusses um, that discusses the representation of IPv6 addresses and also RFC 5952, okay? Um, they said that as much as possible, um, usually you represent the one that is um, on the rightmost side, okay, with the double column. So the double column must be placed somewhere closest to the rightmost side, okay. So so if you base um, base your answers on that RFC, which is just a best common practice, then this one is more preferred, okay. But either of those two answers are correct, okay. Any questions? Okay, if not, we can proceed to the next one. So here I just wanted to show you how many IP, like how many bits are there in the IPv6 address. So it, let's say here, if you want to represent this in, in bits, that is actually 0010, 0000, 0000, 0001. Um, I want to instill in your minds that this is hex, okay? This is hex and this is binary. So when you represent this hex back to binary, it should be like this. It should be 16 bits. Now, when we do subnetting, you have to keep that in mind so as you will not be confused how to switch back and forth from binary going to hexadecimal digits. Okay, so here I um, you can see a diagram of um, how do we uh, typically give out an IPv6 address from the whole IPv6 pool, okay? This is really important for you to understand because um, you will have, you, you should know by the end of this slide how to, um, what is the smallest IPv6 address that you can give out, okay? What IPv6 block can you get from ISPs or from your upstream providers? So um, first off, you have how many bits? 0 228 bits. Now, the smallest one that you can give is uh, you can assign to just one subnet is actually up to here. That is a slash 64. Okay, which leaves us only up to this point to give from the pool IPv6 pool going down to service providers, going down to um, enterprise users, and going down to smallest. Um, units, which are, let's say, one LAN, okay, one subnet. 
Okay, now if we say subnet, whether you have two computers there or 100, 200 computers or more, then that is one subnet. Okay, one subnet, as you know, same concept as in IPv4. Okay, everyone on that uh, network is part of the same collision domain. Okay, so um, that means that you only have this, 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 and this for um, the distribution of IPv4. How many can an ISP get? How many of you here are working for service providers? If you only already have an IPv6 address block, then most likely you would have got a slash 32, okay? A slash 32 IPv6 block. And Mark, um, let me just finish with this particular slide and then we can go back to the previous, okay? So I hope that's okay. So here, so slash 32 is given, okay, usually to a service provider. You can, of course, request for more, but if you think about it, slash 32 is already very huge. How? Why? How come? Compare that with IPv4. That is already equivalent to the entire IPv4 address space. That's how big a slash 32 block is. Okay? But, of course, if you have a need and you can justify it, you can request for more than a slash 32. Now, from that, each service provider gives, okay, anywhere from a slash 64 to a slash 48 to their customers. That's usual. That um, This space is, of course, to allow you to have more, uh, more customers. If you are giving out slash 48 for each customer, you will have two rings to 16 customers for one slash 32. Okay? So this, this um, amount here, this difference here, gives you the leeway to assign slash 48 blocks to two raise to 16 customers, okay? So let me just write that. So that is two raise to 16. Okay? So um, next here, um, the reason I told you that you can give one slash 64 to a customer to here, this customer here might be really, really small, meaning that customer only have one subnet, okay? What if um, that customer wants to, like, um, have more, 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 like, um, divide their network, let's say, into groups, into units. Let's say you have a unit for your finance team, you have one unit for your technical team, one unit for, let's say, um, um, human resources team. So you don't have a leeway if you only have one slash 64. So usually for end sites, you give anywhere from, it's usually it's somewhere in between should be okay. Slash 56, okay? There's no real reason for giving slash 56 except that it's somewhere in the middle of slash 64 and slash 56. Okay, so one question from Amar is if we have classes for IPv6. The answer is no. There is no such thing as classes anymore. Even with IPv4, uh, we are not using classful addressing. Okay, when you say class A, B, and C, that is classful addressing. We have stopped using classful addressing, I think, since 1995 or 1994. Okay, so up to now with IPv6, we're not doing that as well. Okay. Um, okay. So, so that's about it. That's what I wanted to share with you with it, with this structure. How many blocks can you give to an, a customer? It should be somewhere from 64 to 48. ISPs normally get slash 32. Now, do you ever wonder what this is? Like, um, how come we're limited to only 64? Because this part is used to assign to one single host. Okay, we will discuss later about interface ID. Okay, so meaning if one host is assigned an IPv6 address, then the last, last slash 64 or the last 64 bits is actually its interface ID. And there are many ways to assign that. We will see about that later. Okay, Amar, do you still want me to go to the previous slide? Do you have any question with this? Okay, while you're looking at that, um, the question is, can we have a subnet like 64 plus 16, meaning a slash 80? Um, no one is stopping you, but if you're going to use interface ID, then of course you need a slash uh, a, a 64. 
Also, most operating systems nowadays cannot interpret anything that's smaller than a 64. So if, um, if that's the case, then you can't. Any other questions? Okay, I have one question from Amar about why are binary digits changing values? Okay, um, I don't quite get your answer, your question, so if you can please um, elaborate that further. But if I understand it correctly, correct me if I'm wrong, um, you are asking about this and this. So 2001 here, are you thinking that this is binary? Because this is not binary. This part here is not binary. That's what I've been trying to reiterate um, and explain to you guys. It's not binary. This is binary. Okay? So if you interpret this one here, because this is hexadecimal, when you write that down into binary, 1 in hex is equivalent to 0, 0, 0, 1 in binary. Okay? So I think, yeah, Amar already got that. Thank you for that reply. Um, any other questions? Is there any network or broadcast IP? Oh, very good question, um, Swan. Well, there is no such thing as broadcast with IPv6. Okay? So the, again, there is no such thing as broadcast with IPv6. Instead of broadcast, we're not using that anymore. Instead of that, we're using multicast and anycast. Okay? I'm not sure if I have a set of slides about that here because it's usually in the overview. But basically, since we don't have broadcast, because that's not really a good thing, because what broadcast means is like you are entering a room, you are shouting to everyone that's in the room, and everyone can hear you, right? So in, 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 in a way, broadcast is like you are telling all the machines in that particular network, okay, if you're only trying to find someone, like one host, everybody else can hear it. So that's just adding noise to the network, okay? And as you know, broadcast has been used in a lot of attacks before, so it's not really good. So that's why with IPv6, IPv6 actually introduced a lot of improvements from IPv4, aside from the increase in the, in the IPv6 address space. Okay, so that's one of those improvements. Another question coming in is, if a customer requires one connectivity like slash 32 in IPv4, should we give him a slash 64 in IPv6? Um, one connectivity, do you mean just up links to you? That's usually a point-to-point -point link, right? So, um, let me just try and do something. So if it's like a point-to-point, -point, like if you have your CPE or something like that on your end going to your customer here, so let's just say those are two routers. So one is your uplink or maybe an access router or something. Um, this is the point-to-point -point link, okay? Usually, you do only assign one slash 64 on that link. Actually, you can assign a, a slash 127 on this link, okay? Why, why slash 127? That's because you only have two IP addresses, one from your end, another from the end of your customer, okay? So you only need two IP addresses. Now, um, the, the best common practice now is yes, assign a slash 64, although when you actually assign the IP address on these two points, you will only use slash 127, okay? Um, do you have any questions, um, Ahmed? Look back. Of course, look back, uh, you're right, that's um, probably, that's what MTS just said there, it's slash one, if you need to um, the a look back address for this router that is slash 128. Okay, so that's similar to slash 32 in IPv4. Okay, in IPv6, is there still a need to input the subnet mask? No, it's not. When you write an IPv6 address, I'm not sure, I think I have that somewhere in the slides later on, we're actually using prefixes. Okay, so an IPv6 address is not complete without a prefix. Okay, so you write down your v6 address, slash something, slash 128, slash 64, slash 32, and so on. Okay, very good questions, guys.
So here now is like the just the overview of the address management hierarchy when distributing IP addresses coming from APNA. So for ISPs, ISPs get a slash 32 allocation coming from APNIC. So depending if you're like an APNIC member, you can either get an allocation or assignment depending also if you're a service provider or just an, or an end user. If you're an end user, you will get an assignment. So most enterprise companies, um, um, academes, let's say big organizations like banks, um, usually get a slash 48 assignment. Okay, so if you go back to the previous slides that we have, remember we're giving out for customers, we're giving out any anywhere from slash 64 to slash 48. So that's kind of the same thing here. So members get a slash 32. If you have downstream ISPs, you don't want to assign them a slash 48. Okay, that's because they also have um, end user customers. So there should be a way for them to assign slash 48 to, the, to their customers. So if they have plenty, so this means if you assign slash 40, you have two raised to eight customers who can receive a slash 48 from this downstream ISP. Okay? Of course, they can still assign the smallest box, which is a slash 64. Now, um, we will discuss the different types of IPv6 addresses. Okay, so with IPv4, remember we have something like a public address, which is visible, okay, or um, uh, you can access from the entire IPv4 public internet. You also have private addresses such as 192.168 slash, um, was it slash 16, 172 slash 12, and um, 192 slash, uh, slash 24, okay. So those are private addresses. Now, in IPv6, we have something similar to that. Actually, we have more types of IPv6 addresses. And we can categorize them into three. They can be unicast address, an anycast address, or a multicast address. So what's the difference between these three? As you can see, there is no broadcast. Okay, For, We don't have broadcast with IPv6. We're only using either anycast or multicast to um, as a replacement for broadcast. Unicast is, of course, very easy. That's one-to-one. -one. Your one source interface connects to another um, single destination interface. Okay, so that's unicast. So if you set a source address and a destination address, send a packet to a unicast address, only one interface in the destination address can receive it. Anycast and multicast are very similar. So let me discuss multicast first. Multicast is one to many. So if you have one source, you have many destination machines. Now this destination machine belong to the same group. We call them a multicast group. So if I am sending out packets from the source, it is sent to one address, but this address is a multicast address. And all of these machines have the same multicast address or they belong to the same multicast group. Okay, so in that case, if I send out the address, all of them will receive it. It is the same in the case of a mailing list. So if you can't understand when I'm explaining um, the definition of multicast, think of it as a mailing list. So if I send um, an email to a mailing list, everyone that is a member of that mailing list receive it. Okay, so that is the same as multicast. One question from Jean in IPv6, is there still a need to input? Oh, okay. I think I've already answered that question, right? So yeah, I must have didn't see that earlier. But yeah, so going back, um, so we've mentioned multicast. Multicast is clear, right? So you have one source, destination is many host addresses. Now, any cast is similar. It's about the same. The re difference is, this is also still one to many, many destination here, but only the one that is nearest gets to receive the packet. So um, it's like I'm, um, I'm sending it to an anycast group, but only the person that is closest to me will receive the package that I'm sending. All right, so that is anycast. 
any class servers, uh, any class um, model um, are not really very typical yet with IPv6. But if you want an example, this is very similar to how AnyCast DNS works. AnyCast using IPv4. So you have many DNS servers scattered all around the world. Some of them, let's say, same authoritative servers for, let's say, the same domains. But if you um, query them, only the one that is localized in your area, possibly one in Asia, one in the US, one in Europe. If you're in Asia, the DNS server that will answer your query is the DNS server in Asia. Okay? But all of them have the same IP addresses. So that is an example of any cast. Okay? So all these three addressing models, okay with everyone? Is this clear? Um, is any cast random? Does the user know which particular will be receiving it? So it has got something to do with routing or with um, the routing protocols that's at work. So Depending on that, um, if we call it like distance or the, like bandwidth or the hop count and all that. So that all depends on that. So um, how, how you put it, how you set it up with, with your routing, that's how it's going to be sent to the one that is closest. Okay, Amar, so that answers your questions, hopefully. So, all right. First things first. These are the um, most common IPv6 addresses, the one that doesn't really require a network prefix. That's because they are referring to a single host. So loopback address. Loopback address for IPv4 is 127.0.0.1. With IPv6, the loopback address is colon colon 1 slash 128. Okay, so what do we mean by that? We have to Columns. We have a double column here. Okay. Remember, um, this is a representation of all zeros. That means all of the um, characters or hexadecimal digits here are zero, and then only the last bit is one. So that is our loopback address. An unspecified address, on the other hand, is all zeros. Okay. So same with IPv4, all zeros. But it's easier to write it down. Just use double colon, right? Because that means they're all zeros. That's your unspecified address. Now these two, one of them is already deprecated, but basically this was used before when we were about transferring or um, starting to use IPv6 together with IPv4. This made it easier for um, software developers and when creating applications or programs because they don't want, to, they don't have to create sockets for IPv4 and then separate sockets for IPv6. So it's like inclusive because we are using IPv4 and uh, embedded into the IPv6 address. How do we write that? We're using this, colon colon FSFF slash 96. Okay, why is this 96? Do you remember? Because we have 128 bits. Now, the rest of the 32 bits Okay, that's why it's 96 here, because we need 128 bits, but we need to allot 32 bits for IPv4. So the rest of the addresses is, is used um, to represent the IPv4 address. Okay, of course, this IPv4 address has to be converted into hexadecimal digits. Okay, so the one that is, um, this, this one, IPv4 map, IPv6 address is already deprecated. The one that's being used now is the IPv4 compatible IPv6 address. Basically, FFFF here is removed. So colon colon slash 96. And of course, the last 32 bits is your IPv4 address. Okay. Um, a question from Amar about what if we need broadcast? Okay. That's a good question. What if you need broadcast? That's true. Remember, we have multicast. When you have your IPv6 address, as you will see later on, all v6 interfaces that are enabled for v6 will automatically automatically get an IPv6 address. Okay? Now, automatically as well, it will become part of a multicast group. So let's say, for example, um, they, they're part of one uh, one subnet, then they will be also part of a multicast group that is in of that of that VLAN.
que es de, if you're talking about, um, what they call that, routing protocols, like all OSPF, um, OSPF machine, uh, uh, routers, all um, BGP routers will also have their own multicast group. So um, what I'm saying there is you don't really need broadcast because automatically they'll be part of one multicast group. So all you need is that it will still, it can still do its queries. You can still do actually like an ARC thing that you do with IPv4, okay? All right, so next one is the different address ranges. We've already talked about the unspecified address and loopback addresses. Now, um, let's talk about this four. First of all, we need, of course, something that is vis visible on the internet, which is like the public IPv4 address equivalent in IPv6. That is our global unicast address. Notice that it is a slash 3, okay? So from this slash 3, this is our global IPv6 address pool, okay? So from that, actually all regional internet registries got a slice from that block. And from that smaller block, that's where all of us service providers and enterprises get our IPv6 block. So if you come to APNIC, the request for your IPv6 address, you will get a global unicast address, okay? A global unicast prefix. Another one is a link local address. It's very easy to know if it's link local because it starts with FE80, okay? All, um, when I said earlier that all IPv6 interfaces that is enabled will have a, an IPv6 address automatically, that means um, I'm referring to a link local address. They will automatically get a link local address. Okay? I hope that's clear. And also multicast address, this is automatically done. They will be part of a multicast group. And you will know that it's multicast because it starts with FF00. Okay? So unique local address, I will um, um, discuss that in a few slides from here. But it's basically also a private address okay but it is globally unique that's why it's called ula or the unique local address so as you can see here with, with different types or different address ranges there is a specific block assigned to it so it's easy to distinguish between each of them okay so link local address first again it starts with f80 it's a special address okay, that's used only for the, the local link. What we mean by that, if they all belong to the same network, if they all belong to the same subnet, then they are part of the local link. So let's say I have a machine here. Okay, this machine, and then we have another machine. Okay, I come into a room, I connect it to the local um, like Wi-Fi link maybe. Okay, that means that since I'm in this link, I can automatically actually connect with this other machines in this network, okay, without passing through, um, without, without a networking device sitting in between. So let's say this is a switch or something. If you're passing on traffic, right, if you're sending packets, usually it goes through here, going through your destination. Now here you can add, right, connect to this one without any intervention from your uh, a, a, a networking device. So that's how easy it is. Like, um, you don't need to set anything up. The reason we have link local address, and as you will see later on using interface ID, is because we wanted to, let's say, when we sit down, connect to a network, we don't want to um, bother writing down IP addresses and that stuff automatically we should be able to connect to the different machines that are belonging to the same local link. So that is the idea bit behind a link local address. Okay, um, one thing to note here of course is that it's only useful or usable as long as they are part of the same local link. That means they are not passing on to any layer two device. In this case, 
they won't go through a router, okay? Because after the router, all um, the, the machines behind the router are not accessible using the link local address, okay? So try that. Let's say you have a router sitting in between, okay? Same here. Then you have a router here or something. You have another machine on the other side. This is not pingable using the link local address. However, this should be pingable, okay, or accessible using this IPv6 link local address. Okay, I hope that's clear with everyone. So this is X, meaning it's not possible. The next one is we're done with link local address, unique local IPv6 unicast address. We also just call this a unique local address or a ULA. As I've mentioned earlier, this will be unique all throughout the internet. Okay, there is a way in which it can generate a pseudo random uh, uh, random numbers based on an algorithm such that it will be unique. So anything that starts with FC00 slash seven is actually belonging to a unique local address. When do we use it? If you want something that's still private, okay? Remember RFC 1918? That is the private addresses for IPv4. It discusses all about um, 192 and 172 and 10 um, IPv4 blocks that are used for pri private purposes. So similar to that, that's the purpose of a ULA is the same, okay? Um, because you can't use a link local address to address other machines that are beyond networking devices. So we still need a unique local address. Now, um, notice it's starting with FC00 slash 7. So if you see any IPv6 link local address, you actually would have noticed that it starts with FB00. Okay? The reason for that is um, from FB, FC00, okay, there, this is the block that you usually will get your ULA. From FC00, it is divided into two. Okay, so from one slash seven, you're dividing it into two slash eight. The first slash eight is really not being used yet at the moment. It is like reserved for future use, usage. Um, the, it is, um, in, it's still under negotiation or under, under discussion in the um, in the standards committee in IETF, of course. But the idea there from before is it's going to be used so that IPv6 address will be more hierarchical. So it will be used for RIRs, NIRs, or ISPs. So when you're using ULA now, it starts with the second half of the IPv6 uh, of this ULA IPv6 block, which is fd00 slash a okay so if you want to use a ula have a look at these links basically will help you generate um, a unique ula prefix that you can use for your machines okay so we've got we're done with two now with a global unicast address this is the block that again we're giving out to everyone that's requesting from an IR or from your ISP. These are equivalent to your public IPv4 address space. So if you go and come to APNIC request for your block, your um, IPv6 block will actually be um, a subset of this, 2400 slash 12. The reason being is that from the slash 3 IPv6 pool, okay, so we have this, let's say this is slash 3. This slash 3 is divided into slash 12. So how many should there be? Okay, so each slash 12 is given to each RIR. So let's say this slash 12 is given to APNIC. Okay, then this slash 12 is given to Aaron. Another is given to RIPE NCC. Okay, so all of that. So that means how many slash 12s have already been given out? Five, e, um, one slash 12 for each RIR, which still gives us a lot of reserve from the slash three. So if I can just ask you, how many slash 12s are there in slash three? Okay, I saw that someone also posed the same question. So how many slash 12s are there in one slash three? Can anybody, anybody answer that? 
So same as you do with subnetting with IPv4, right? You have slash 12 over slash 3. So that is how many? 2 raised to 9, which is how much? That's 256. So there are 256 slash 12s and 1 slash 3. So we've already given out um, 5 of them. There is one slash 12 block that has been reserved and it's being used for experimental purposes. So that means that you still have about 250 left slash 12 that can be used at any time. So if APNIC runs out of that slash 12, they can just come back to um, the body that um, is in charge of the whole IPv6 pool, which is IANA. They can always come back to IANA and request for their another slash 12. Okay, so that is the global unicast address. Now, another type of V6 address is 6 to 4. So you might have seen this if you, um, say, um, subscribe to services of, let's say, Hurricane Electric and all that, which are providing tunnels. So this address is used for tunneling purposes. So during the transition, for everyone, who does not have native connectivity to an IPv6 um, internet yet, so we, maybe their upstreams doesn't provide that feature yet, so they can use tunnels, and these tunnels will use a, uh, a specific block, which is 2002 colon colon slash 16. Any questions with this? So um, let me just discuss one final block that is also IPv6 block that is used mainly for documentation. Have you had a problem where you tried something out, but then the specifications or the documentation actually refers to actual IPv IPv4 addresses, and then it created some problems or errors, okay? Now, the reason for having this is to avoid such problems in the networks. So instead of using anything that is publicly accessible or should be globally addressable, then we will use for all our documentations, for exercises, for um, examples, we use certain blocks. So these two blocks are reserved only for that. Usually, um, in most cases, you will see that they're, they're using this block more than the first one. Okay, so remember when I gave you an example, I used 2001 DB8. That is really because of this. All right, so we have already kind of extended. It's already 3.36 in my time. If you are still interested, um, I can continue on and discuss. We still have a few slides left. We will discuss about interface ID, UI64, some auto configuration, and towards the end, I have some subnetting examples. So if you still have time, please um, still join me. For those who cannot, um, I would understand that. You can um, leave at your, um, uh, depending if, if you want to go, you can, you can also do that. But I will continue. I think it will take me about 10 to 15 minutes more. I hope that is okay with everyone. Let me just wait for, okay, very good. I think you're all interested to know more about IPv6. That's why you're willing to stay. So now we are going to discuss interface ID. If you go back a few slides from here, later on you will get a copy of the slides. Go back a few slides where I showed you a diagram of the whole IPv6 block and how we divide them from ISPs to customers. And then the last 64 bits, if you notice, I also mentioned that is all about the interface ID. Okay, so interface, interface ID is the lowest order 64 bits of your address. Now, how do we um, assign address on that part? There are different ways. The most common one is using auto configuration, using what we call a modified EUI 64. Okay, so this is based on the MAC address of a machine. So if I have, for this machine, because you all are aware that MAC addresses or physical addresses are unique addresses that is only assigned to one machine. So that means my interface ID will be unique among all other IPv6 uh, link local addresses. Okay, 
Also, um, some cases, if you're using like global unicast address, you can still set the interface ID part to use EUI64. Okay, um, that is one way. That is the most common way. Um, you can also assign the 64 bits using, of course, the HCP, or it can be manually configured. This is, of course, because this is how we do it with IPv4. So it's still possible to do it in the same way. There is another way, it's, uh, which is auto generation using pseudo random numbers. Now, um, how many of you are using? Um, I think. Yes, Imcha Ahmed, yes, uh, the HTTPv6, I'm referring to that. Um, how many of you, I think, are using um, the latest versions of Windows? Or I think even the latest versions of um, Mac OS X are already using pseudo-random numbers. Now, let me just give you a brief story about this. Um, you all know by now that EUI64 is based on MAC address. Now, let's say I connected to the V6 network while I'm here in Australia. Of course, I will have a different prefix for my V6 address, but my last 64 bits will be the same, right? Because again, it is based on my MAC address. Now, I will go into the US for one week because of holiday, and I will still want to connect to the IPv6 internet. Now, once I'm there, I will have a different prefix for the V6 address, but again, the last 64 bits will be the same. Now, there is an issue there for some people Okay, for some people in the community, see that as a possible, um, not really a loophole, but a possible vulnerability that might be taken advantage of in the future. Okay, because also from the privacy point of view, you don't have much privacy there because, again, you're, if you're using the same machine, you are trackable wherever you are around the world. Now, I don't see any problem with that, but um, for some people, they, yeah, the, um, they want a, a way in which you won't see their their last 64 bits. So that's why they created this other option, which is auto generation using pseudo random numbers. Um, by default, if you're using, like I think, starting from Windows 7 and also Windows 8, um, if you have your IPv6 enabled, when you get your IPv6 address, whether it be link local address or a unique local address. Notice the last 64 bits. If it is based on that address, then it is using EUI64. But if you don't do anything there, by default, it is based on pseudo-random number, meaning all of the 64 bits there are just randomly generated. It's not based on anything. Okay? I hope that's clear. Um, for other machines, the default is actually using EUI64. Amar is asking if, by looking at IPv6 address, we can know the MAC address. Yes, yes, that is so true. So I will show you in this next slide how that is done. So we start off with the MAC address. From the MAC address, we, we will generate the um, um, interface ID. So how many um, digits do we have with a MAC address? A MAC address is 48 bits. Okay, so what we do is, the Divide them into half, the upper half, okay, is here, this is your lower half, all right? Now, since we need 64 uh, bits, this is only 48 bits. What we do is insert something in the middle. In this case, the one inserted is constant, it is FFFE, all right? It's always FFFE. The reason for this is unclear, but I think if you look at um, the, the possible, um, what they call it, the codes that are given out to different uh, manufacturers, I think this is only, it, this is the part with, uh, which is not assigned to anyone yet. So it is FFFE. Question there also, we can't be sure if it's MAC address or pseudo random. Um, well, if you have your V6 address right now, okay, double check whether your MAC address, some parts of your MAC address is in the V6 address. That's basically how you do it. So if you see that some parts like this here, just check one, one area, let's say this upper half. If you see parts of that in your V6 address, then you're probably using EUI64. 
Okay? Um, if we're in the same room, I can help you look it up. But we're not. So um, just based on this, this diagram, try and find out whether your interface ID here is based. So reverse engineer it to get your MAC address or something like that. Okay? So your actual interface ID is this whole thing. Now, the reason it's called modified EUI64 is because we're making some changes with the 7th bit. Okay? So where is the 7th bit? Here. Okay? So this 00, zero here is actually in hex. So if you write that down into binary, that's 8 zeros. So where is the 7th bit? This one, in yellow. So you set that to 0 if it's unique, or set it to 1 if it's not unique. Or is it the other way around? Um, Okay, I think I think I'm right. Um, so it's set to zero if it's unique, one if it's not unique. Um, and then if 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 that's the case, we basically just toggle between the two. So let's say if you're using spoofed um addresses, then it's probably not unique. So set it to the other one. Questions? No questions now. Okay. So next one is zone ID. So for all of you using Windows. You can see that in your IPv6 address, there is something with a percentage after your IPv6 address. So in this case, we have a link local address here. Okay, FE80. Remember FE80? That's because uh, link local address starts with FE80. Then you have this, and then a percentage four. Now, can I ask you from here? Can you tell me if we're using um, EUI64 here or not? Can you tell me? It's very easy to locate if you're using EUI64 because it's using FFFE somewhere here. Okay? And if you go to the previous slide, remember, somewhere in the middle, we're using FFFE. So most likely for this machine, okay, um, your, uh, what do you call it, your MAC address is this. PCD0, okay, EE94121. All right, so Amar, um, have a look. If you have something that is like this, FFFE here, then you're probably using EUI64. By default, Windows machines, and I think even the latest versions of, uh, the late, just the latest version of uh, Mac OS X is using um, sudo random. But Linux and um, just all the versions of Mac OS X are using um, EUI 64 by default. Now, okay, going back to this, we're talking about zone ID. So um, here there's a percentage sign. It has to do with zones. Um, if you remember, I talked about the unique local address. Before we had unique local address, there is something called site local address. The idea behind site local address is um, you have like these private networks. Okay, and each of them will have unique addresses. Okay, but the problem is it's vague. You don't know the demarcation line. Where is the boundary between these sites? How do you define a site? So there is a confusion there. You can have the same IP address um, well, in each of the sites, and then it's it won't be unique. Okay, if you define a bigger scope for your site local address. So here is this. Zone ID stands out from that. So percentage four, you're referring to a, to one zone. Now the easy way to describe this is, let's say we have this machine here. This is a one interface. We have another interface here. You may have different connections going to say the same machine. So we have this zone, okay? And then you can have other zones as well. Have I told you that one interface in IPv6 can have multiple IPv6 addresses. So here you can have a link local address, you can have um, a unique local address, a global address, all in the same interface. It's not the same with IPv4, where you need to, let's say, assign two interfaces. One will have public, one will have a private address. That's not the case. That's why we have zones in IPv6, because just this one interface here, will have many addresses. So if you have link local address here, 
that's a different zone. Okay, so if you're connected to another machine using this zone, maybe it's represented by person four, person three. So it's not really cumulative, okay? Um, it doesn't just add up. It's randomly generated by the operating systems. So um, if you want to ping, let's say, this machine going to this machine too, okay, you will need to assign the, um, the zone ID from you. So in this case, if let's say our scenario is we're trying to ping from host A to host B. This is our host A IP address. This is our host B IP address. They have different zone IDs. Zone IDs are only um, valid in their own segment. So if I'm machine A and I assign person 4 for this link, then machine B doesn't have an idea that uh, it would that it should refer to a percentage for zone ID. Okay, it will assign its own zone ID for the same link. Okay, so it's only valid within. So if I try ping from host A to host B, since I'm gonna use the link, okay, the link in my local machine, which is percentage four, the zone. So when I ping, I ping this IP address, but I use my zone ID. So we're using percentage four here, not percentage three. All right, so I hope that's clear. If not, please let me know. Otherwise, I'll just continue to the next one. So auto configuration. Um, one good thing about IPv6 is auto configuration. Now, um, auto configuration, it started out even before we have DHCP. So as you know, IPv6, the development of IPv6 started out um, early in the 1990s. It's really kind of an old technology by now. But only thing is, we're just starting to adapt it. Now, auto configuration was uh, was like that. They, it is being developed at the same time as DHCP. So you can have like stateless mechanism, which acts similar to a DHCP, but it is dependent on, um, there is no third party that is assigning an IPv6 address to that. So when we did the interface ID earlier on, when it's assigning that, then that it can be considered as a stateless mechanism, right? That's good, no additional service required. But the only problem there is like, if you need specific addresses for, let's say, if you have servers, okay? So in that case, you, you should use something like more stateful, something that will um, have a third party that will assign a DHCP address, okay, or a manual address, on that um, interface okay so point point in case here is if you're just assigning machines that's part of your network say end user machines laboratory machines okay customer machines then you can use stateless mechanism but if it's something that has to be static that's unchanging in most uh, most of the time like servers or networking devices routers switches and all that then you might need to assign a stateful um, address to that. So this is how auto configuration basically works. So if one machine connects to the network, it will tentatively assign an IPv6 address to itself. Okay? It will assign what we call a link local address. As you know by now, a link local address starts with F80 and the last 64 bits is either random or based on EUI64. In this particular example, let's just say that it is based on EUI64. So this is your tentative address, okay? FE80 and then your uh, interface ID somewhere here. Now, you're not sure yet whether this is unique. Although you, we know that MAC addresses are unique, that's not always the case. So you always have to check the other machines in the same network. We call that process as a duplicate address detection or DAD. Okay, it will transmit um, queries um, for everyone in this node. Usually, you will think that it is, this is broadcast, okay? But since we don't have broadcast with IPv6, it will send that solicitation, we call that solicitation as neighbor solicitation, it will send that message to a multicast address, which is, starts with FF02, okay, okay, and, um, and the rest is based on your UI64, right? So it will send that to that multicast address. So all assigned 
um, IPv6 address has a corresponding multicast address. So after that, if there is no neighbor advertisement, there is no reply, then it is sure that it's unique, then it will assign that IP address to himself as a new host. Okay, very easy, right? So now, let's say, let's just say there's a router in between. Now you wanted to get a unique local address or maybe even a global address, okay? So we will get that from a router. A router will supply that information or even a DHCP server or a, a something that does router advertisement. Now, the difference with DHCP version 4 and v6 is that with DHCP v6, we're only giving prefixes, okay? We're not assigning the entire IPv6 address to a machine. We're giving them the prefix. The last 64 bits is again based on EUI64. So that's the same case with router advertisement. You are only advertising a prefix assigned to this block on, and the machine is uh, in charge of the rest. So what you'll do if you want to get a unique local or a global address is you do a router solicitation. Find the router that does advertise a block. Okay, the router will give you its router advertisement, meaning it will give you the prefix. In this case, the prefix we're assigning is from a slash 64 block, which is 2001 colon 1234 colon 1 colon 1. There should be a colon colon there, um, some typo. So um, basically, this is your block. So you will then assign an IPv6 address based on that. So notice here that your block starts with 2001.1234, and the rest, again, is based on the uh, EUI64 of the, of the interface ID. Questions? Are you still with me, everyone? Can we still go? So here, uh, this is just very quick now because this is subnetting. I usually just leave them to, them to participants to try and work out. It's basically when you do subnetting with IPv4, that's how you do it with IPv6. Now, the only difference that I would I would say should you should um, notice or you should um, be aware of is that you're dealing with hex digits here rather than binary or rather than decimal even. So when you um, you have to switch sometimes from hexadecimal going to binary, but then always remember to go back to hexadecimal. Okay. So let's say here that this is our, our example. We have a slash 32 block. We are a service provider and we are providing slash 48 blocks to our customers. Now my question is, what is the first of the blocks that is given out to the first four customers? So basically you have this original block slash 32 block. Now what you do is just extend it so that you have your slash 48 blocks, okay? So that means you are, you are adding an extra field, okay? And then, What's next? That's your network prefix. You need the 4 slash 48 blocks. Oops. Oh. Okay. Find the first 4. So you're actually just making changes in this particular bit. So you have your network is, of course, your whole slash 32 here. And you're finding out slash 48. So you're basically cha changing um, the bits between your slash 48 and your slash 32. Um, make sure that you write them down. If you're just starting to do this, make sure that you write them down into binary. Otherwise, once you're used to it, you can stick on with hexadecimal and so you'll see that it's just easy. As long as you're working on the nibble, okay, remember when you talk about nibble, we're referring to the binary, uh, the, the, um, each each hexadecimal digit. So as long as we're working per nibble, okay, then everything should be easy. So basically, once you write it down into bits, just increment it, okay, and just make sure to write them down back to hex. So in this case, our first four slash 48 blocks is 2001BB8000 slash 48. This one, this First one, you can simply write it down as, of course, 2001 dB8 
colon colon slash 48. Okay, so it's just a change of prefix slash 32 going to a slash 48. All right. Okay, so the first block is always easy to easy to see. Any questions with this? If not, um, I have here, I've included a few exercises, I think just two. This first one is finding the first four slash 36 blocks. And the second example is, um, sorry, there's a typo there. Find the first four slash 35 blocks. So try and do this. I encourage you to do this. If you don't know how to get there, you can ask me questions on the way. Um, if you come up with the answer but you're not sure whether it's correct or not, you can also send it to me and I will verify if it is correct. So that's it basically what I wanted to discuss. Any questions? Last questions from everyone? If not, um, I'll just type in the link to the survey. As I mentioned earlier, there will be a survey towards the end. So this is the survey form. So please um, fill that up for me. And after that, if you want to have a copy of the slides, after filling up the survey, you will be redirected straight away to our FTP. And that FTP site contains all the materials that we have done for today. Okay, so you can download all three PDF uh, copies of the slide materials that we've done for the e-learning today. So with that, I don't think I have anything else to add there. Any final questions? Okay, so if there's none, I think I'll end there and I will um, close this session. Thank you very much everyone. Thank you. Um, we've extended quite a bit again. Um, I always enjoy this class. Um, I enjoy that you have a lot of questions. That is very good because I know that you're listening and you're learning something from the class. So thank you very much for attending. I hope that you can still join our other e-learning sessions. Again, if you want to have a look at which topics you want to join in, just go to our website. That's apnic.net slash training and then register for the one that the one